So it was towards the end of 2017 where I was lying on the floor in my wife's arms, just bawling my eyes out. I was literally wailing. And I was saying things like, I, I have no idea what I'm doing anymore. I'm a total failure. I'm 46 years old and I have nothing to show for my life. And I'm completely and utterly exhausted. So my wife, my wonderful wife, she gave some words of encouragement, which she always did. But this time it was different. Um, I was done. I was finished, you know, nothing could help me. I mean, I didn't cry out to God. Um, I was just broken. And without knowing it, I had surrendered. So from that point, over the course of about a month and a half, Jesus started revealing himself to me, to my wife, and our older son separately. So I was born into a secular Jewish family. We observed a lot of the traditional Jewish holidays or the holy days, such as Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Hanukkah, and Passover. I was bar mitzvahed at age 13, uh, which was more or less a fun and social event. And when I was younger, my parents worked really hard to give us a comfortable and safe environment growing up. But that being said, their childhood was not the easiest. Uh, my father's father, or my grandfather, uh, died when my father was still a teenager. And my mother lived in an environment where she basically had to raise herself. So they worked really hard and they gave us a great environment, but the environment was relatively stressful. Um, there was a lot of fear and anxiety in the home. And I'm not saying anything negative about my parents here whatsoever because they did an incredible job with what they had and what they knew and they made incredible improvements from the previous generation. So I'm very thankful for them. So that being said, I grew up pretty insecure and ill-equipped to handle things like stress and responsibility. So Judaism for us was just something that we did. It was more or less a cultural experience, which I think is uh, very common. And I felt no spirituality in it. Um, and to use the words of a good friend of mine, uh, it was pretty much dead, dry religion. So we go to synagogue and the prayers and Torah portions were done in Hebrew. So I, myself, and most of the people in the synagogue didn't know what they meant because they were in a language that they didn't understand. So it felt to me that it was, it was weird. It was kind of fake in a way. So most of the people in the synagogues that I went to were just happy basically spending time together, you know, and reinforcing their cultural ties with other Jewish people. But for me, there was no God in it at all. And after my bar mitzvah, I really had no desire to continue any kind of uh, connection with Judaism. Let's just say I was left uninspired. So college for me was a blast. I excelled in sports and the arts. Uh, my grades were pretty bad. <laughs> um, I didn't like studying, but I loved sports, athletics, and I was a, a gymnast, a collegiate gymnast, and absolutely loved producing stage shows. But there was still that underlying problem of insecurity. So as I went through college, um, I started to gain a little bit of popularity, even though I was bullied a bit when I was younger. And that felt good, but the only problem was that I was still insecure. And those securities would follow me basically from one sheltered environment to another sheltered environment, you know, from home into college. And so I still didn't really know how to deal with stress issues, confrontation. Um, I, I didn't enjoy sticking up for myself, so I let people kind of walk on me. And I always felt like I wasn't good enough. And so I would constantly look for people's approval. Thus, the uh, initiation of relationships that would basically be used to enhance my own personal uh, self-worth. So after about five years of college, I was fed up with my bad grades and left to take my chances at becoming a pop star in Los Angeles. So my qualities of insecurity and looking for approval was not really a great combination uh, in a city where uh, rejection is really the name of the game there. So audition after audition, I continue to get rejected with some occasional gigs being booked from, from time to time, which would kind of keep me going. But it really took a number on my uh, self-esteem. So that insecurity turned into fear, turned into anxiety, and that just really literally primed me for a headfirst dive into New Age spirituality. Now, New Age spirituality focuses on self-realization, self-awareness, with an emphasis placed on Eastern philosophy. Let's just say that New Age spirituality, where I was in control, was the best offer for peace that I had found to that time. I wasn't seeing my fellow Jews and the religious community living peaceful, loving, and inspired lives. And oddly enough, the most spirit-filled, happy, peaceful, giving, 
and kind people that I had ever met to that time were believing Christians. And I thought, wow, those people are the nicest people I've ever met. But they believe in Jesus, and I'm Jewish, so I don't. So that's not really for me. At least that's what I was taught and I accepted as truth without really knowing anything about the Hebrew Scriptures or the New Testament. So in my early 20s, I found myself reading every New Age spirituality book I could get my hands on. I started following a spiritual teacher that taught me how to meditate and clear my mind, to think more deeply about life, and to witness my own behavior. I focused on the present moment and repeated positive affirmations regularly. And because of all this, I started noticing that my self-confidence started to rise, which was great because um, I just felt like I was more in control. Now, I was also taught that the man that I was following, the spiritual teacher, was like a modern-day deity, and that I should follow and submit, basically, to everything that he said, and that would come back to haunt me later in life. But then it was an amazing experience. I mean, I felt myself getting deeper and uh, becoming more spiritual, kind of getting an edge on everybody else that you know didn't know what I knew. But it was only when I found myself in a relationship with the girlfriend that I had at the time, and we separated, and I felt like my life was just over. I mean, like everything had come to an end. And I was so torn up by that, that my eyes were just suddenly opened. And at age 24, I really felt like I needed to change my life completely. So that was when I decided to sell all my possessions and buy a one-way ticket to Israel. Why Israel? I just honestly felt guided to go there. So I used that experience of about nine months to really just dig in, get some discipline, and grow up. Um, I worked in the fields as a mango farmer. I learned Hebrew. I went to the military for a couple months for boot camp, uh, which was pretty intense. Um, but at the same time, um, in an attempt to try to uh, enhance my ability to deal with uh, pain and stress, I would actually um, physically harm myself as well. I would burn myself, I would cut myself, and I would do things that I kind of felt um, pushed internally to do and you know let's just say that it was an experience where um, I was really trying to get everything that I could possibly get out of this experience and kind of grow up as quickly as I can because the um, image that I had of myself was not a good one so while I was there I would continue to enhance my meditation techniques um, I would study and I would uh, practice a lot so I was really disciplined and I would do my best to detach from the things that I loved, which is a common practice in Buddhism, which is a detachment or non-attachment. So after I came back to the US, I tried another couple attempts at success in the entertainment business, which once again resulted in failure. But I had this new sense of confidence that I was like, wow, you know, I'm, I'm bilingual now. Um, I'm spiritual. I'm deeper than I used to be. I'm not as easily affected by things. And I had this like spiritual advantage over other people that I knew. But this, this, this attitude really wasn't confidence. It was more of me becoming kind of like a smug, arrogant, you know, spiritual teacher that I thought I was. And the God I heard about growing up became me, intermingled with the energy of the universe or, you know, politically correctly called he, she, or it, or how a lot of people use this day, the universe. So at that time, I decided that spiritual development, spiritual enlightenment was the best path for me and nobody was gonna get in my way. So I ended up writing a couple of books that never got published and then went through a string of relationships that were painful and unhealthy where I ended up hurting a lot of people in the name of my progress. I mean, these relationships were based on my own personal needs purely. And if they didn't enhance my progress towards my spiritual goals, then I would just leave. Now, I still had ties with that spiritual teacher, and the more time went by, the more I started feeling oppressed because of that connection. And I'd be getting these internal impulses more and more over time that if I didn't do these ridiculous things, um, that, you know, this looming presence or something that was, you know, here, something bad would happen to me. So the more time that I meditated on silence, the more time I emptied my mind, the emptier I became, which proved to be a fantastic breeding ground for oppressive or demonic forces to have their way with me. And this seems like a common thing to happen to a lot of people that follow uh, New Age spirituality and the occult. I even remember having a out-of-body experience once where I was laying on my bed and I came out of my body and turned over and I looked down upon myself, I floated away, and then I came back, and then I came back into my body. And when I came out of that, 
I was like, wow, that was an incredible experience. And I tried my hardest to make sure that that experience would happen again, and it never did. But I was getting pretty deep. I even took it to the point where I was meditating an hour and a half a day, every day for about six months, doing these weird poses and saying these mantras out loud and meditating on silence um, for an hour and a half, literally every day. I mean, one thing about me is that I'm really a committed and devoted person to what I'm doing. I mean, I have a lot of discipline with regards to something. So if I'm doing something, I'm going to go all the way with it. So it was a true um, practiced experience. So all this time, I was still drawn to Israel. It was a great experience over there. Um, it was tough, but um, living in California, I would always kind of dream about being back there. So over the course of the next five years, I would just jump back and forth. I'd be there for a year, then back in California for a year, then in Israel for a year. And I would do that until I eventually ended up meeting my wife. And by that time, I was 34 years old. So we practiced meditation together and have these really deep, interesting conversations about life. And after we got married, we had our first child relatively quickly, which was something that we were both really excited about. We then opened up a business together, uh, which we ran and owned for eight years. The only problem with that, though, was that my philosophy of detachment and empty-mindedness and the need for silence came face to face with the reality of complex relationships, emotions, and responsibility. So the more responsible I found myself having to be, the more isolated I became because I would go into basically the noise of the world and then say, wow, this is too much. So I would isolate myself, pull back and ramp up my meditation because all that noise would basically just disturb the peace that I'd worked so hard to gain. I literally became antisocial and the more emotion I felt in the midst of my relationships and the more attachment in the midst of my marriage and fatherhood, the more I battled these emotions with meditation, non-attachment and positive affirmations. So the more the, the pressure of having a business weighed on me, the more I would clear my mind and meditate to try to kind of hang on to any momentary peace that I had. So when we had our second child and the business was growing, I found myself between a rock and a hard place practicing the Buddhist philosophy of non-attachment in the middle of these complex relationships and circumstances that I was very attached to, and rightfully so. I mean, this was my wife and my children and my livelihood. So the more stress I felt, the more and more I felt like I was failing. So I would just ramp up my practices even more and spend more and more time alone. I mean, my marriage was always strong and we were always respectful, but honestly, my wife started having a harder and harder time living with me. And I couldn't understand after all those years of meditation and discipline and practice, why this philosophy or these practices were not standing the test of time. You know, they weren't leading me to the life that I was told I would attract to myself. So depression went from mild to chronic. And by the age of 40, I was starting to feel horribly anxious and horribly frustrated. I started to fear the future. And honestly, I still felt oppressed from that spiritual force that was just kind of looming over me. And this is when I started to lose all hope. Now, I know many people out there will understand where I'm coming from who also bought into mass-marketed New Age spirituality when you're told that through positive affirmations, through Buddhist philosophy or Eastern philosophy, coupled with removing desire, using mind control, denying negative thoughts and emotions, and doing whatever we can to keep a happy face, that at some point we will achieve a certain level of enlightenment, a certain level of spirituality or freedom, you know, in the hopes that someday that happy face and that happy slogan, like whatever you believe you will receive will eventually result in a happy me. Now we all know it's not a smart thing to trust a deceiver, yet we can be our own worst deceivers. We're so good at deceiving ourselves into believing that what we're doing and what we're uh, thinking and, and, and our philosophy is right with no real evidence to back it up. So I went through life with some serious issues that I never really gave any importance to. I mean, I sprayed positivity all over my deepest, darkest issues, and those that knew me could see the duplicity of my reactions and my behaviors. The only person that couldn't really see it was me. I mean, on one hand, I'd pronounce my positive slogans to the world, and on the other hand, the stench of these deeper issues would rise to the surface. Now, it's a common thing in New Age spirituality to see people deifying themselves and touting a lot of positive slogans in an attempt to really cover up for all the pain and the damage that they've caused to people in their past. As if a new slogan or a smile can really erase all that pain and hurt that people have done. 
But in as much as we want to think of ourselves as the creator, we're not. And that becomes obvious when things aren't going the way that we planned or imagined. And when we're struggling through life's challenges, what we're really told is there must be a problem with our thinking. So my mantra has changed from I can attract anything I want to basically I'm so exhausted with life. And I could no longer trust my own philosophy and I surely couldn't pass that down to my children. And my influence on my wife was getting worse and worse. So I felt great when I was in my 20s, you know, unburdened, free to roam the world. But as soon as the responsibility of fatherhood, being a husband, being a business owner, and responsible for others, when that kicked in, I felt pretty incapable and no amount of meditation or mindfulness or present moment awareness could truly help for any significant period of time. So in a prideful attempt to prove my philosophy right, I would ramp up my meditation once more, only to find myself exhausted and confused once again. So not only was I reaching the bottom, I still felt this spiritual oppression that had been haunting me since my early 20s. And no matter what I did, I couldn't shake that. So it was towards the end of 2017 where I was lying on the floor in my wife's arms, just bawling my eyes out. I was literally wailing. And I was saying things like, I, I have no idea what I'm doing anymore. I'm a total failure. I'm 46 years old and I have nothing to show for my life. And I'm completely and utterly exhausted. So my wife, my wonderful wife, she gave some words of encouragement, which she always did, but this time it was different. Um, I was done. I was finished, you know, nothing could help me. I mean, I didn't cry out to God. Um, I was just broken. And without knowing it, I had surrendered. So from that point, over the course of about a month and a half, Jesus started revealing himself to me, to my wife, and our older son separately at the same time. But this was strange at first because we weren't looking for Jesus, especially as new age secular Jews. You know, we grew up learning that Jesus was not for us and that we shouldn't believe in him. And in many cases, he's used as a curse word. Even in the tolerant new age community, you know, Jesus Christ is used as a curse word or to, you know, give out some sort of expression of frustration. We honestly weren't looking for anything, but we would leave the house and have these experiences that were related to Jesus and then come home and talk about them. I mean, everywhere we went, we became like hypersensitive to everything related to Jesus. I mean, I'd go to the gym and I would meet people, specific people, like the only people that I actually wanted to go up and meet that were believing Christians. I mean, we were drawn to everything Jesus and it was weird to us because we weren't expecting that. And my wife had a difficult time with that because she felt like she was being drawn in by herself, not from me. And in her mind, she was like, well, we don't believe in Jesus because we're Jewish. But we'd come home and we put the kids to bed and we put on a, a TV series or a documentary about Jesus and we would just be completely enamored and drawn in. And we had experience after experience. And the most amazing thing about that was that it was happening to all of us at the same time. I mean, at that point, after all of my effort, I wasn't trying to become something or become any part of a certain religion, yet we were being all drawn in at the same time. Now, one day I was down visiting my parents and my wife had taken my kids on a trip to Israel, so we were separate. And I went to my parents' house and my father, my sweet father, um, he's an atheist or at least an agnostic, I'm not quite sure, but he would, um, as far as I can remember, I would see him laying in bed with a book every night. So I'd open the door up and he's in bed, sure enough, with a book. And I don't remember him ever uh, recommending a book to me, but I was standing in the hallway and he walks down and he says, hey, Jeff. And I said, yeah. And he came down and he said, hey, a friend of mine gave me this book and for some reason I thought you might be interested in reading it. And he didn't know what I was going through at the time. All this stuff was happening. But this time he made a point to walk down the hallway and hand me this book. And I take one look at the cover and the title is Living on Borrowed Time, The Imminent Return of Jesus. I mean, I was stunned. I mean, little did he know the part he was playing in all of this. And I asked him, I'm like, what are you doing reading a book like this? And he said, oh, I just have a Christian friend who, you know, wanted me to read it. So I read it and I thought that you might be interested in it. And he, mind you, he'd never recommended a book to me before. So I go in my room and it's just another example of Jesus showing up for me once again. And I just totally started reading that book. And it was, it was incredible. So not only were these kinds of experiences happening daily, I literally felt myself coming back to life and through no effort of my own. I mean, I wasn't meditating. I wasn't thinking positively. I was just allowing Jesus to just saturate me with his love. 
So when my wife and kids came back from Israel, we discussed maybe starting to go to church, but there was a little bit of resistance to it because of the fact that we were Jewish <laughs> and Jews don't believe in Jesus, but I couldn't and we couldn't negate all of those incredible feelings that were happening within us. And my wife had her resistances because she didn't know how to connect her Jewish roots with Jesus because she still wanted to continue to practice some of the Jewish traditions. But I did care about how my wife felt. So we ended up finding a lot of testimonials on uh, Jews that came to faith in Jesus on YouTube channels and websites such as One for Israel and Jews for Jesus. And as soon as we realized that we could be Jewish and believe in Jesus, that that was the most Jewish thing we could ever do. I mean, Jesus was the most influential and popular Jew in history. I mean, all the apostles were Jewish. The Bible and the Old Testament, New Testament were all written by Jews, maybe except for Luke. So we were blown away and then decided to start going to church. So one night I was at a men's study and we were studying the story of the Transfiguration. So if you're not familiar with the Transfiguration, it appears in the book of Mark, uh, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9, with parallel stories in the books of Matthew, chapter 17, and Luke 9, starting in verse 28 where Jesus takes three of his disciples up to a mountain to pray. So the disciples slept, and when they awoke, they found Jesus talking there with Elijah and Moses. So Peter, one of the disciples, wanted to make three tents, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for Jesus. And as Peter was saying these things, a cloud came over the mountain and overshadowed them, and they were afraid to go into the cloud. And a voice came out of that cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. So for some reason, that story really inspired me. So I rushed home to tell my wife about it. And I went in the bedroom and I was like, honey, guess what we learned about tonight? We learned about the transfiguration, about how Jesus is the only one. But I'm feeling compelled to tell you a more detail about the spiritual teacher that I followed, the, some of the things that he said and the oppression that I felt since following him. Now, mind you, we hadn't given our lives to Jesus yet. We were kind of asking each other, okay, when do we do it? Do we do it now? How do we do this? So we weren't sure. But one of the predominant things that was going through my mind through this whole process was wanting freedom from that feeling, that oppressive feeling, just asking for freedom. And I didn't really even know who I was asking. I was just asking for freedom from it because I couldn't do it myself. So once I told Yael, my wife, about that story, she said, you know what, last night I had a dream and I was in this place and I was running with these children. And as we were running, one of the kids broke off and went into this room by himself. So I decided to go follow that kid. So she went and followed, she opened the door. And when she opened the door, she saw this boy sitting in the corner, trembling with this demonic force or presence standing over him, tormenting him. And she told me that. And I told her my story. And she pointed at me and she said, that man was not who he said he was. And what you thought about him was not true. And as soon as she said that, and I thought, Jesus is the only one. Listen to him. This incredible energy went through my body. I was sitting on my bed. And this energy went through my body. And in that moment, and it gave me the chills, it was gone. Not only the oppression was gone, but my fear these chronic, chronic emotions, these, this fear, anxiety, frustration, disappointment were gone in one moment. I mean, I was meditating for 20 years, working to develop myself, and in one instant, Jesus flicked it all away. And I put my hands up and I said, I'm free. I'm free. And we literally fell to our knees and gave our lives to Jesus Christ. And I literally lose it every time I tell this story because it was so powerful and it was so real and it was nothing of my own effort that saved me and freed me. No book that I could read, no spiritual teacher that I could follow. No illusory sense of self-worth and self-confidence that I gave to myself. Nothing. 
could free me, but Jesus, Yeshua. And it was in that moment that I realized that peace was not the absence of something, but the presence of something, or should I say, <laughs> someone. So it sounds ignorant to me now to hear people talking about Jesus as a, a great spiritual teacher or as an ascended master, but he surely wasn't the Messiah and surely wasn't God. You know, he was just a great man. Yet the Bible clearly states that Jesus claimed to be God, as it states in the book of John. So for instance, in John chapter 19, verse 9, it says, They, the Jewish leaders, said to him, Jesus, where is this father of yours? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father too. And from John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him, which is what they did um, with regards to the penalty for blasphemy, which was uh, the death penalty. Uh, Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It's not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being man, make yourself God. So the common New Age belief is that Jesus was just one of us that just happened to, through his own effort, reach enlightenment. You know, he was able to show us what we're all capable of, you know, Christ consciousness. And this belief is, you know, ignorant and arrogant because it's not based at all on what the Bible says or what the eyewitnesses that knew Jesus said or what Jesus said about himself. I mean, most people claim, as I did, that Jesus was just whoever you wanted him to be. And if you wanted him to be an ascended master that went off to the Himalayas for a period of his life and came back to Israel with a saffron robe, then so be it. But that's not what the scripture says and that's not what he said about himself. I mean, this philosophy comes from Eastern pantheistic religion, and Jesus clearly refuted pantheism. So a year and a half ago, being born again and being baptized three months later, my life has changed 180 degrees. I literally have been resurrected and brought back to life. I have a lot of new desires, and a lot of my old ones have fallen away. I have a new hope for the future and a abiding joy within me that stays there even through the struggles and through pain because those things still happen. I mean, I used to cuss and swear, I had a dirty mouth, and those words just can't come out anymore. I can't, I can't use profanity anymore, which is incredible. You know, in my old practices, I used to put signs up on my, my mirror and you know something around my finger to try to change my bad habits through my own effort, but the Holy Spirit comes in and does that work because the Holy Spirit who lives in the in the temple of the Holy Spirit that we should be taking such good care of um, can't live in a profane environment and so these old habits um, get uh, tossed out by the wayside I haven't tried to attract anything into my life I haven't tried to meditate and get peaceful yet this deep peace fills me even during my most stressful times my marriage has improved drastically and my tolerance and patience for my children has increased tenfold. I have this insatiable desire to read the Bible that I've never had before. I've become really social and I love spending time with people. I love spending time with my family. Um, I love having people over and we like, you know, we like inviting guests over. So that's a huge shift because I was so isolated. I've become fully aware of my past behavior. Um, and realized how horrible it actually was. And I've repented of that seriously, I, which really means, you know, you turn the other direction and go the other direction. You feel bad about what you've done. You say sorry for what you've done and you turn another direction. You go away from those behaviors. And that's what repentance is. I mean, experiencing the supernatural didn't happen during those 20 years of New Age spirituality. And through all that effort that I put in, it was only when I turned to Jesus that the real supernatural actually happened. So God's love in Christ became more real to me than any desire for fame or money or career or status. 
You know, I used to try to become something big in the community. I would try to piggyback off of other people's success, you know, tag them and, 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 and name shout so that I could, you know, ride on the success of other people to enhance my own personal image. And this is such a popular way to get ahead in social media where everybody's trying to become, you know, their own little god or, you know, this big success story and where self-worship just runs rampant. So this is no longer desire for me either, which is incredible. So this hope and security doesn't mean that we don't have any more struggles or challenges. Um, it may actually mean that we have more. I mean, being a Jew and taking Jesus into the Jewish world is not an easy thing. And trust me, it's not warm and welcoming. So there are a lot of new challenges here. And it's not always comfortable. But there is the underlying peace that God gives. Not the peace that the world gives. Not the peace of meditation or that any kind of effort can bring. The peace that lasts and that doesn't crumble in the storm or when the wind blows. I heard a quote from someone that was really nice. Um, it, was, it was wonderful and I wanted to share it with you. He said, if you have problems in your life and those problems look like mountains, Jesus Yeshua can move those mountains. And wow, he sure did. So if you're having your own struggles, just know that Jesus is for everyone. He's not just for the Christians or the Jews. He's for everyone. As it's stated in the Hebrew scriptures, Psalm 67, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. And in the New Testament, Luke 24, verse 45 through 47, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So being open-minded doesn't mean believe everything blindly. It believes following the evidence regardless of how it makes you feel. God is real and he's not this impersonal energy field or the created universe. He's a personal being that loves you and has hope and a future and a purpose for you. So thank you for watching and I hope you stay with me. And if you're seeking truth, not relative truth, but absolute truth, just know that God promised to reveal himself to all those that truly seek him with all their heart.